behalf of the uh, MIT Summer Session, let me indicate how happy we are to be participating in this edition of the University Video Communications Distinguished Lecture Series. Our speaker tonight, uh, Guy Steele, received his uh, PhD in computer science here at MIT in 1980. He's probably best known to those of us here as uh, the co-developer of Scheme and of Common Lisp, or perhaps as the editor and chief organizer behind the Hacker's Handbook. He, however, has uh, many talents outside computer science. Uh, he is, for example, a composer and singer with the distinction, probably the unique distinction, of uh, having his sheet music published in the communications of the ACM. He also uh, has demonstrated his programming skills by becoming an outstanding Chinese chef. He is uh, a senior scientist of Thinking Machines Corporation, where he is responsible for the design and implementation of parallel programming languages and other system software for the connection machine computer system. He will be talking to us this evening about data parallel algorithms. Guy? The data parallel programming style is an approach to organizing programs suitable for execution on massively parallel computer systems. In this talk, we're going to characterize the data parallel programming style. We're going to examine the building blocks used to construct data parallel programs. And you will see how to fit these building blocks together to make useful algorithms. All programs consist of code and data working together. And there's usually some processing agency, a processor, which using the code as instructions operates upon the data to compute some useful result. Now there are different ways of building this processor. If you have a single large processor, or perhaps even a single small processor, operating upon the code and operating on a single data item at a time, you have a typical serial sequential von Neumann computer. On the other hand, you might have many individual processing elements interpreting the code and acting upon the data, in which case we have a parallel computing system. And there are different ways of organizing this parallelism. In control of that parallelism, the emphasis is on organizing the program so that the processing elements can take advantage of parallelism in the code. Typically in this style, different processing elements might be at different places in the program text so that you have different pieces of the program being executed all at the same time. Now, of course, you don't simply operate uh, by executing instructions without regard to the data. Each of the processing elements must have some access to the data, and this may be in a regular or irregular pattern. But the emphasis is on extracting parallelism by orienting the program's organization around the parallelism in the code. In the data parallel programming style, by contrast, the emphasis is on organizing the programs whose extract parallelism from the organization of the data. And the, the underlying metaphor is to think of there being enough processing elements that for every data item of interest, there's a processor that can, that can be attached to it. And again, it's not that the processing elements are operating on the data without regard to the code. There almost must, must be some means of having the uh, processors interpret the code. Now typically, but not necessarily, all of the processors will be at roughly the same point in the program. This is characteristic of the, of the data parallel programming style. But it's not a necessary feature. It is possible to organize a program in a data parallel way and yet have the processors be at different, different points in the code. But, but having a single locus of control most of the time is a typical characteristic of this style. Now I want to draw a distinction here between control parallelism and data parallelism, that distinction on the one hand, and a slightly different distinction about architectural styles, about the design of hardware, which are usually labeled SIMD for single instruction, multiple data organizations, versus MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple data organizations. I think it's important to draw the distinction between the style in which a program is written and the way in which the underlying hardware is organized, because the two don't necessarily have to be the same. It is perfectly reasonable to write a data parallel program, which is then executed on a MIMD computer, or for that matter, on a sequential computer. And similarly, a control parallel program can be executed on a sequential or a SIMD kind of computer. And so my emphasis in this talk is going to be on styles of organizing programs rather than styles of organizing hardware. It then becomes an engineering issue of whether it's worthwhile to match the hardware style to the program style or not. Now, the sequential programming style is typified by programming languages such as C and Pascal, has certain standard themes and certain standard building blocks which you see all the time. Examples of these are scalar arithmetic operators, control structures such as loops and if-then-else statements, and subscripted array references. 
And the experienced sequential programmer knows a great many standard and useful ways of fitting these building blocks together to make useful algorithms. And furthermore, he has a good idea of the costs of these individual building blocks. While it's nowhere cast in stone, most of us as sequential programmers know that an addition and a subtraction and perhaps a comparison all cost roughly the same, whereas a multiplication or division might cost a little bit more, depending on the underlying hardware. Similarly, a procedure call might be a little bit more costly than an if-then-else statement. Now, the precise costs depend upon the implementation of the programming language and on the implementation of the hardware. But still, it's important to have a good idea, a reasonably good model, a set of expectations about the underlying cost of the primitives before you can expect to write effective and efficient algorithms in a sequential programming language. Similarly, in order to write good data parallel programs, we need to become familiar with the appropriate building blocks for building data parallel programs, and we need to have a good idea of their relative costs. So now let us examine certain standard themes that arise naturally in data parallel programs and consider specific building blocks that are used to implement those themes. The most common themes that I see popping up over and over again in data parallel programs are element-wise operations. And these are, these are operations which can be carried on by the individual processors independently, each on their own pieces of data, without communication among the processors. And typically these are arithmetic operations and tests of various kinds. There are also conditional operations, which are also element-wise, but in which some of the processors perhaps do not participate, or perhaps act in slightly different ways depending on the content of the data. Then there are various forms of communications among the processors, which include replication, reduction, permutations, both regular and irregular, and parallel prefix operations. These are by no means the only themes, but these are the ones that I want to focus particular attention on tonight. Let's take a look at an example of an element-wise operation. Here we have a, what looks like an ordinary Fortran, say, or C assignment statement. C gets A plus B. But the interpretation here that is intended is that A and B represent arrays. And here we see eight processors. And each processor has its own value for A and its own value for B. And the direction is for each processor to, to execute an addition and store the result in C. And so you can see that the first processor has added 3 and 6 to get 9. The second processor has different data. It has added 1 and 2 to get 3, and so on. Similarly, conditional operations can be carried out element-wise. Here we are comparing the contents of the array A and the array B element by element, and setting a flag shown at the top of the graphic to indicate whether or not the test succeeded. And so we can see that in the first column, the test failed because 3 is not greater than 6. Whereas in the third column, the test succeeded because 4 is greater than 1. And the result is a series of Boolean results, a series of bits, one per processor, which can then be used to, to conditionalize further operations. Here we have an example of using the result of that test to perform a conditional addition. Only processors whose test succeeded in the previous step will execute the addition step. And so we can see that only the third, fourth, fifth, and seventh processors actually performed the addition and stored the result in C. The set of bits which is used to conditionalize the operation is frequently called an, a condition mask or a context for the execution of further operations. And in this way, each processor can perform different computations based on the co particular data that it happens to contain. Now let's look at some communications operations. One that happens very frequently is to have a single quantity and want to get a copy out to all the processors. This we call broadcasting. Here we have a single number, 43, and we would like to get it out to all the other processors. Now, there are a variety of ways of doing this, depending on the particular hardware you have to support it and, uh, and the particular algorithms you want to use. This operation occurs so frequently in data parallel programming that it's worthwhile and easy to support it directly in hardware. And so it is not unusual to see a hardware bus of some kind to carry a single value out to all the multiple processors. On the other hand, there are other ways of doing it as well. If there are many things to be copied rather than a single thing, a more complex algorithm is called for. Here we have a typical example in which we have a vector which occupies a row of a matrix. We would like to copy that vector to all the rows of the matrix. So we don't have a single quantity to be copied. Rather, we have many quantities. But they are to be copied in a reasonably regular pattern. Now, one very simple way to do this, if each processor associated with a piece of data in this matrix is able to communicate with its nearest neighbors, is to copy the row step by step 
down the matrix, each copying to its nearest neighbor until the entire matrix is filled. This operation is called spreading, and here we have managed to copy the first row down to all of the others in seven steps, because this is an 8 by 8 matrix, and 7 is 8 minus 1. But there are other ways of doing it which are faster. If you have additional communication links among the processors that you can exploit. Here we will assume that a row of a matrix, in fact, can be, can be communicated not only to the next row down, but in fact to a row down that is a power of two away. And we will see that we can do the operation much faster. First, we take the first row and copy it to the second row. But now each of those rows can send copies to their neighbors that are two rows down. And then each of those rows can send copies to neighbors that are four rows down. And by jumping in, in increasing steps like this, we can fill the array in only three steps, which is logarithmic in the size of the array, three being the base two logarithm of eight. And so we have an, another way of executing the same spread operation, which is logarithmic in the number of processors rather than linear. And this is typical of a lot of interesting parallel operations that can be carried out in the data parallel style. You see logarithmic execution times popping up all over the place. Reduction is another very common operation that is essentially the inverse of broadcasting. In broadcasting, you take a single value and make copies for all of, all of the processing elements. In the case of reduction, each processing element has a value, and you're trying to accumulate a single result by combining them in some interesting way to produce a single result. Again, I've shown here how you might want to have some kind of hardwired facility for doing some reduction. In this picture, the eight processors shown at the bottom of the screen each have different numbers, and their sum is 27. So the number 27 shows up centrally. There are other ways of doing that as well. Let us take a look at an algorithm that can be used to sum a vector in logarithmic time. We start out with a vector that has eight elements, x sub 0 through x sub 7. In the first step, we add them pairwise, so that x sub 0 and x sub 1 are added by the second processor, x sub 2 and x sub 3 by the fourth processor, x sub 4 and x sub 5, by the sixth processor, and x sub 6 and x sub 7 by the last processor. And so four of the processors, by doing these additions, have produced partial sums for, towards the work of producing the total sum. In the second step, we add these partial results pairwise again. And then in the last step, again another pair. And we see that the last processor has received the sum of elements 0 through 7. Notice in this diagram that we've used the notation sigma with a lower and upper bound to indicate exactly which elements have been summed so far. Please also note that most of the time during the course of this algorithm, most of the processors have not been particularly busy. In the first set of additions, only half of the processors have been occupied doing additions. In the next step, only a quarter of them. And in the last step, only one eighth of them. And so we can see that while this is fast, we haven't made use of all of the processors. An interesting question arises. What would happen if you didn't turn off the processors and let some of the other processors also do, do additions? you actually get another very interesting building block for data parallel algorithms, which is parallel prefix algorithms. We're going to carry out the same set of computations again, but leave more processors active. We start out with x sub 0 through x sub 7 laid out. And in the first step, we sum pairs, but notice that they're overlapping. We sum x sub 0 and x sub 1. We also sum x sub 1 and x sub 2, and so forth. And so each of the processors except the first has computed a sum. Then in the next step, we compute more sums. All but the first two processors participate. And then in the last step, all but four processors participate. The result has a very interesting property, that each processor has received the sum of what it contained plus all the processors preceding it. In other words, if we regard the original input as an array, then we've computed the sums of all prefixes of the array, that is, all initial segments of the array. I sometimes call this the checkbook operation, because if the numbers that were in the array elements were a series of credits and debits against your checkbook, the checks you'd written and the deposits you'd made, then the result of the sum prefix operation is the series of running balances that should appear in your checkbook. And we will see examples of how this operation can be, can be useful in other ways later as a building block of the algorithms. A very simple example is an operation known as enumeration. In this operation, we wish to assign a different number to each processor. 
And this can be accomplished easily in two steps using building blocks we've already seen. The first being broadcasting. We take the number one and broadcast that to all the processors. We then apply a sum prefix operation so that each processor receives the sum of the one that it contains plus all the ones preceding it in the line. And the result is that each processor gets a different number from one through eight. Sometimes this is called the bakery operation because it's like all these processes have walked into the bakery and each one has gone up to the little machine and taken a ticket and each one has gotten a different number. But it's happened very fast rather than doing it sequentially one at a time. Another very important operation is various kinds of motion of data without particularly performing any kind of arithmetic operation. And uh, most of the, the interesting ones are permutations. Here's an example of shifting a linear array of data. Uh, this is an end around shift to one place. One could imagine shifts of other distances. But in this case, the entire array has been shifted one place to the right, and the rightmost element has brought, been brought back around to the front. Now, of course, one can do shifting not only on one-dimensional arrays, but also on two-dimensional arrays. You might have a two-dimensional matrix and want to shift at one position to the north, or three positions to the east, or 4,096 positions to the south. Another kind of permutation is an odd-even swap, shown here for eight elements, in which A and B have exchanged places and C and D have exchanged places. One might also imagine more general forms of swap, where one swaps with a neighbor that is a power of two distance away. Permutations of this form are very often seen as steps in algorithms such as the fast Fourier transform and in various sorting algorithms. A hardware architecture that is capable of performing all distance two to the k swaps turns out to be equivalent to a hypercube, which is one of the reasons why the hypercube is very popular as an underlying hardware architecture for algorithms of this style, because it can easily achieve many of the interesting permutations on, on data that are necessary building blocks for these uh, algorithms. Some algorithms call for performing irregular permutations on the data. Most often this comes up when the permutation to be performed is dependent upon the content of the data. In this graphic, we've illustrated a sorting algorithm. Now, in fact, here it, it's as if the sort has been computed magically all at once, and every processor has figured out exactly where to send its data. The data is sent from the top row to the bottom row, and poof, it's ended up sorted. In practice, real sorting algorithms undergo a number of intermediate stages where they calculate intermediate places to send the data, and after a number of steps, the data ends up sorted. But the point is that the particular permutation involved is dependent upon the content of the data, therefore cannot be predicted in advance, and therefore cannot be pre-wired into the hardware. We can see this by considering an example from image processing. Let's suppose that we have an image of, say, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, a picture that we've taken of a spaceship. And we want to do processing on this image. And so we've assigned a processor to each of the pixels of the image. And the question is, where is the rocket ship? Well, some of the operations we need to perform on this image are local. And so we might focus in on a particular region of the image and uh, have each processor look not only at, at its own pixel value, but also at the pixel values of its neighbor. And from, from this, determine, for example, whether that a particular pixel is on the boundary of an object or somewhere in the middle. And this is a local piece of processing that involves a fixed pattern of communication. It involves regular permutations, which involve shifting the array back and forth uh, so that each processor can look at its neighbor in a particular fixed direction. On the other hand, when it comes time to assemble this boundary information and put it together into a single global object, we can see that the particular patterns of communications are going to be dependent upon the content of the image data. That is, which processors have to communicate with which other ones so they can all agree that they are part of the image of the same object depends upon where the rocket actually happened to be in the image. Most of the building blocks that we've looked at so far have concerned themselves with operations on arrays, which are very rigidly organized kinds of data. But it is also possible to have very irregularly organized kinds of data. For example, one might have a graph structure in which nodes are organized not by being neighbors within some fixed geometry, but by being connected through pointers instead. In this graphic, we have shown the nodes as being lined up side by side, just, just for ease of seeing what's going on. But in fact, you should imagine them as being eight processors in completely different parts of the machine, 
known to each other only by an address indicate that it uniquely identifies the processor. And we've indicated these addresses by pointers. So we can see that the first processor knows the address of the second processor. The second processor knows the address of the third. And I had originally thought that nothing could be more, more essentially sequential than the need to follow a linked list of pointers. Because you just can't find the third one without going through the second one. But I was wrong. I forgot that there is processing power at each node of the linked list. And you can take advantage of that to do things faster. The most important technique is known as pointer doubling. And this is the pointer analog of the spreading operation that we looked at earlier in order to make a copy of a vector into a matrix in a logarithmic number of steps. In the pointer doubling method, each processor first makes a copy of the pointer it has to its neighbor. Then, at, in a repeated series of steps, each processor looks at the processor that it's pointing to with this extra pointer and gets a copy of its pointer. So at the first step, each processor has a pointer to its neighbor one away in the linked chain. But as the first processor looks into the second processor and gets the pointer to the third processor, and as each of the other processors do the same thing, we see that the next step, each processor will have a pointer to a processor two steps away in the linked chain. And if this operation is repeated, each processor can then have a pointer to the processor four steps away in the chain, except that if you fall off the end of the chain, then you don't update your pointer. And if you keep doing this, then after a number of steps logarithmic in the length of the chain, every processor will have gotten a pointer to the end of the chain. And this happens in only a logarithmic number of steps rather than a linear number of steps. And I think this is sort of an interesting and surprising result. Now let's see how that can be used by considering nodes that not only have pointers to their successors, but also numbers. And we're going to compute a parallel prefix, a set of partial sums, on this linked list. And the algorithm is very similar to the one we saw before on a vector, except we're taking advantage of the pointer doubling technique. At the first step, each processor simply takes a pointer to its neighbor. At the next step, each processor takes the value that it holds and adds it into the, into the place pointed to. So for example, in this diagram, the first processor is going to add its x sub 0 into the x sub 1 in the next processor, whereas the x sub 1 is going to be added into the x sub 2 and the x sub 2 into the x sub 3, all in parallel. And then we'll take a pointer doubling step. And the result looks like this. The first processor still contains x sub 0, which can also be noted as sigma 0 to 0, which is just the sum of x sub 0 through x sub 0, which is simply x sub 0. The second processor has the sum of x sub 0 through x sub 1. The third processor has x sub 1 through x sub 2, and so forth. And we've doubled the pointers. Now we do this again, and we see that, for example, the fourth processor now has the sum of x sub 0 through x sub 3. And the seventh processor has x sub 3 through x sub 6. Now notice in this last step that the third processor will add its sigma 0 to 2 into the seventh processors, sigma 3 through 6. This will cause processor 7 to have the sum of 0 through 6. And after the third step, in fact, if you tra carefully trace through it all, you will find that each of the processors has gotten the sum of its own number plus all the preceding ones in the list. And again, in a logarithmic number time steps. So we see that we can do interesting things not only with arrays, but with linked lists in this data parallel programming style. Now let's talk about, a little bit about the distinction between speed and efficiency. In sequential programming, usually these terms are considered anonymous. If a program is fast, then it must be efficient. If it's efficient, it must be fast. But this coincidence of terms comes about only because you have a single processor to work with, and you're trying to get the most horsepower you can out of it, and it's the only one doing things. But in the parallel case, it's not so, because sometimes you, you can make it go faster by, in some sense, doing extra work more than you had to by taking advantage of the fact that you've got extra processors to work with. Let's consider, for example, the uh, algorithm that we saw earlier for summing a vector. And let's compare that with the serial algorithm. With a serial algorithm, you would write a loop, and within the loop, you would have indexed, subscripted accesses to the array. And you'd set up an accumulator, initialize it to 0, or perhaps initialize it to the first element of the vector to save an addition, and then add in successive elements of the array. 
So you would do this using one processor. It would take n minus 1 time steps. And you would have to do n minus 1 additions, uh, uh, pairwise additions, because that's the minimum number you can get away with. So we say that the work involved was n minus 1. That was the number of additions performed. The cost, which is the number of processors times the number of time steps, is n minus 1. And the efficiency, which is the amount of work you got done, the number of additions, divided by the cost, is 1. Now let's compare that with the parallel algorithm. In the parallel, vector sum algorithm, we used n processors to do it, one for each data element. We did it in log n time steps, and we still accomplished n minus 1 additions. The cost of this, the number of processors times the number of time steps, instead of being n minus 1, was n log n. We used a lot of processors, and as we noted earlier, most of the processors weren't busy most of the time, and so we wasted a lot of cycles. And so the efficiency, which is the number of additions divided by the cost, was approximately 1 over log n. So as the size of the problem gets bigger, the efficiency goes down, but still the speed compares quite favorably with the serial algorithm. It's log n versus, versus n minus 1. Now let's compare this to the vector sum prefix algorithm. And again, consider a serial version. Just as the data parallel vector sum prefix looked like the data parallel sum reduction, so the serial prefix algorithm looks like the serial sum algorithm, except that you save out all the partial results. You start with the first element of the array, and you save it. Then you add in the next element, you save that sum. You add in the next element, you save that sum. And so after n minus 1 time steps and n minus 1 additions, you computed a sum prefix with the additional cost of simply storing the results out to memory. And so again, you've achieved n minus 1 additions with n minus 1 cost, and so the efficiency is 1. Now let's compare that to the parallel version. We've used n processors and done it in log n time steps. But the number of additions is much greater. If you work, work out the numbers, it turns out to be n times log n minus 1. Because you used n processors and used them at log n time steps, and nearly all of them were busy. So you did n times log n minus 1 additions at a cost of n log n. Dividing those, the efficiency was log n minus 1 over log n, which as n gets very large is very close to 1. So we can claim that this is a very efficient algorithm, because as n gets large, its efficiency approaches 1. And yet, this efficiency is somehow bogus. We achieve this efficiency by keeping the processors busy, doing more than they really had to do in some sense. Because only n minus 1 additions are really required to compute a sum prefix. On the other hand, it appears that more than that are required in order to do it fast. And so we have this curious trade-off that as the speed goes up, the efficiency goes down in some sense. But, but that's masked by this particular efficiency cost by the fact that we actually did more additions than we really had to. So the business of measuring the speed of a parallel algorithm and the efficiency of a parallel algorithm is a very tricky business. And in fact, I think the particular measures that I used in these graphics are a bit naive. And we need to develop a, a better theory of how to measure the goodness, the efficiency, and the speed of parallel algorithms. We've seen a useful set of building blocks for constructing data parallel algorithms. Now let's build some algorithms with those building blocks. For our first example, let's consider matrix multiplication. And this can be done in a large variety of ways. But abstractly, there's a single operation to be, be performed, which is that given two matrices, we regard one as being composed of rows and the other as being composed of columns. And each row of the first must meet every column of the second. And each interaction of a row and a column will produce a result element in the result array by performing an inner product on the two vectors, the row and the column. One way of doing this very quickly by a sort of brute force approach is to use order of n cubed processors. We'll assume that each of these three matrices, the source, first source, the second source, and the result, are n by n matrices. And we will use n cubed processors, and we will organize the matrices by putting the first source on one face of a cube, the second source on a different face, and have the result come out a third face. And we will see that we can do this very quickly in a fairly short number of steps. The first thing we will do is make copies of the first source array using a spread operation to replicate that matrix through, through the cube. Then we will do the same thing with the second source, making copies and spreading those down the cube. Each of these spreading operations takes a logarithmic number of steps. So, so far we've used O of log n time. 
Next, we do a lot of element-wise operations. You can see 16 of the multiplications here in this graphic shown on the outer face of the cube. But in fact, these element-wise operations are happening throughout the cube. And so we have n cubed multiplications going on in a constant amount of time, because we're using O of n cubed processors. Then in the last step, we perform a parallel sum operation using the doubling reduction method that we saw earlier on each of the, of the rows coming up through the array toward the result matrix. And that takes a logarithmic amount of time. And so in four simple steps, we've managed to multiply two n by n matrices in log n time, but, but at the cost of using O of n cubed processors. It should also be pointed out that if the very next thing we wanted to do was to take this product and add it to one of the source of arrays, the result is in the wrong place, and we're going to incur yet an additional cost to move it to the right place so that we can perform that addition. And so that should also be factored into the cost of the operation. Here's another method for doing matrix multiplication that only requires n squared processors. In this arrangement, we take the two source arrays and put them in the same set of n squared processors. And the result will also show up in the same n by n matrix of processors. And we're going to use a very clever technique due to Canon, which involves pre-skewing the two source arrays. The first source array has its rows skewed, and you will see that each row is skewed by a different amount, depending on its row number. And similarly, the columns of the second array are skewed, depending on their column number. Now we will take these two skewed arrays and overlay them, and the result looks like this. The essence of the algorithm, this is a systolic algorithm, is to rotate both of the source matrices at the same time. We're going to rotate the first source matrix horizontally and the second one vertically, like this. And so at each time step, each of the two source arrays will be shifted by one position. And the result looks something like this. And after four time steps, wherein at each step, the two source elements that have arrived at a process are multiplied together and added into a running sum, and magically, the result has been computed after n time steps. Now let's look at that a little more closely. Pay attention to the intersection point at the upper left. You will see that at the first time step, the second element of the first row and the second element of the first column have met in the upper left corner. They are then multiplied and accumulated. Then at the next time step, the third elements of the row and column meet are multiplied together and added in. At the next time step, the fourth element of the first row and the first column meet. And at the last step, finally, the first elements meet and are accumulated. And the same thing is going on at all the other points of the matrix. And the purpose of the pre-skewing is to ensure that each element of each row meets the corresponding element of each column at just the right time. And if you don't believe that, you'll have to trust me. It works. It's, it's really amazing. And so the net effect is that using only n squared processors, we've managed to do it in time n. And an additional benefit is that the matrix ends up in the right place, if you want to do yet other things with it with the other matrices. Finally, let us consider a really big example. We're going to go back to the question of labeling regions in an image. Here, instead of showing you a rocket ship, I showed you a somewhat more abstract image in order to keep the example small. This is one of the difficulties of describing data parallel algorithms, is that they are inherently algorithms oriented toward large amounts of data. But if I try to show you a large amount of data, it won't fit on the screen. So I'm going to do my best here. We have a number of regions in this image, shown here by different colors. We see a large central green region, this little squiggly uh, reddish-orange region up in the left corner. And notice that not every region is a different color. There's, there may be several regions that are the same color. But as long as they're disconnected, we want to consider them to be separate regions. We would like to compute a result that looks something like this, in which each region has been assigned a distinct number. We don't particularly care which number gets assigned to it, as long as each region gets a different number. And all contiguous elements of a single image have received the same number. So we can see here that, that in this sample result, the central green region has had all its pixels assigned the value 19. And the squiggly region in the upper left corner has received the value 0 in all its pixels. The uh, region in the upper right corner which, although the same initial color as the central region, has received a different number. It's gotten all fives instead of 19 because it's disjoint. And we proceed a number of steps. And at each step, we'll see how the particular 
themes and building blocks we've discussed fit together to make an interesting algorithm. The first thing we're going to do is assign a different number to each processor. In fact, here I've shown the, the numbers as progressing across the rows and then down the matrix. But uh, for the purposes of this algorithm, any organization would do, provided we can reasonably quickly assign a different number to each processor. And we've seen how the, the enumeration technique can do this in a logarithmic number of time steps. So we'll assume this particular numbering of the processors. The next thing we do is to have each of the pixels in the, in the image examine the pixel values of the eight neighbors. And this is easily accomplished by using regular permutations, namely shifts of the matrix. We take the matrix and we shift it up, we shift it down, left and right, and also to the northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. And as a result of these shifting operations, each neighbor now knows its own pixel value plus the pixel values of its eight neighbors. This is then enough information for each processor to do element-wise computations and decide, each processor can decide whether its pixel value is on the border of its region or not. Now, there are lots of special cases, and the details get rather messy, and I'm not going to talk about them too much here because they're not central to the ideas involved. Uh, but there are, be aware that there are messy details. Uh, in this example, we have darkened the border squares. You can see them. And the next several computations to be carried out will be carried out only by pixel processors that are on the border. So this will be an example of conditional operation. Only some of the processors will be participating. We have each processor again consider the pixel values that came from its neighbors and also inquire again using shifting of its neighbors whether its neighbors are border elements. This is then enough information to figure out which of your neighbors are border elements in the same region so that you can construct pointers to them. And so what we've done here is to stitch together the border of each region in a linked list that runs around the perimeter of the region. So you can see a linked list running around the perimeter of the central green region. And you can see a linked list running through the squiggly region in the upper left. And each region has had its boundary connected up with linked pointers. We are now going to use pointer doubling algorithms. Each pixel processor considers the number that it was assigned in the enumeration step. And the pixels that are not on the borders do not participate in this consideration. We then use a pointer doubling algorithm, first of all, to do a reduction step using not summation, but the minimum operation. Min is as good an operation for combining numbers as summation is for this purpose, and pointer doubling works just fine for that. So each linked border list will perform pointer doubling around that list and determine what is the smallest number in that list. And then by using another pointer doubling step, send that smallest number and make copies of it all around the perimeter. So now every border pixel knows the smallest number that was on a border element in its region. So for example, the number 19 has been propagated around the border of the central green region. And the number 0 has been uh, propagated down the squiggly region in the upper left. Finally, we can use scan operations, not on the linked lists anymore. We can abandon those now. But by operating on the columns, or what amounts to the same thing, the rows, either one will do. By doing a scan operation in each direction, we can copy the processor labels from the borders to the interior points of the region. So for example, in the interior green region, it actually suffices to copy from the upper edge of the region downward, thereby propagating the label into the interior. Other regions, particularly those that are on the edge of the image, may need the numbers propagated up instead of down. So you do a scan in both directions doing copying. And this, this is done by essentially a variant of the parallel prefix operation that instead of using an operation such as summing or min, uses a, a co more complicated operation that is in fact not commutative but fairly simple, which is essentially if you've come across a new number, take a copy of that and otherwise copy the old number that came in from your neighbor. But it's a legitimate variant. This method of labeling regions in an image is known as Lim's method after Willie Lim. And if you use n squared processors to represent the image in an n by n array, it accomplishes the labeling in log n time. Because each of the steps that was involved was, took either constant time or time logarithmic in the number of processors, given that you had n squared processors to process n squared pixels. Data parallel programming makes it easy to organize computations on large quantities of data for massively parallel computer systems. It differs from sequential programming in that its emphasis is on operations on entire collections of data, 
rather than single elements of the data one at a time. In a data parallel program, you typically find fewer loops and fewer subscripted references to arrays than you do in a sequential program. On the other hand, data parallel programs are typically very similar to sequential programs in containing a single thread of control. At any given point in time, there's conceptually execution control at only one point in the program text. Sometimes this restriction is loosened a little bit, but it's characteristic of the data programming style. This can make data parallel programs easier to understand than control parallel programs. In order to write good data parallel programs, we must become familiar with the necessary building blocks for the construction of data parallel algorithms. And we need to have a good idea as to what the relative costs are. Given one processor per data element, there are many interesting operations that can be performed in constant time on an entire array of data. And other operations which take a logarithmic amount of time or perhaps a linear amount of time in the amount of data. And this depends not only on the inherent complexity of the operation, but also sometimes upon the underlying implementation. If a particular piece of hardware doesn't support sufficient connectivity among the processors, for example, a communications bound operation may take more time than would otherwise be required. Once you become familiar with these building blocks and learn how to fit them together in standard and conventional ways, writing a data parallel program is just as easy as, and just as hard as, writing a sequential program. And given a suitable underlying hardware, your programs may run much faster. I'm Bert Halstead, Deck Cambridge Research Lab. I thought your examples were very interesting, but I was curious whether you ever get into problems when you have highly data dependent computations and it's difficult to keep more than a very small fraction of the processors actually doing the same operation at the same time. Yes, you do. That's a very interesting problem. And that's one reason for making the distinction between the data parallel style and the question of whether you've got SIMD or MIMD style hardware supporting it underneath. It's perfectly possible to have hardware that is capable of giving you some more choice than doing the same thing at the same time. Now, the precise, uh, precisely best method of, of designing a total system that gives you flexibility without making it extremely difficult to control, I think, is still an open research question. I'm Franklin Turback from MIT. You indicated that a number of your algorithms took time that was logarithmic in the size of the problem. And this seems to be based on the assumption that you actually have uh, a large enough number of processors to match the size of your problem. Yet for any real machine that you're going to be running these algorithms on, there's going to be, a, in fact, a limited number of processors. And if the size of your problem exceeds the number of your processors, it seems that the logarithmic time growth is no longer justified. Can you explain that, please? You're absolutely correct, and I'm glad you brought that up. There is no free lunch. And for a fixed amount of hardware, making a problem bigger is going to make the whole thing run slower. It's a question of whether you regard the size of the hardware to be fixed. If you have a much larger problem, so, so big, that it's not going to fit in the computer you have, you're simply going to have to buy a bigger computer. And that's all there is to it. Within the range of problems that your computer can handle, then you will indeed tend to get linear kinds of trade-offs rather than logarithmic ones. It's a question of what you choose to hold fixed in your analysis and what you choose to let vary. I'm uh, Eve Jan van Assel from uh, Holland. I want to ask you the following question. Is there something to say about the uh, portability of the programs to uh, different machines? Yes, there is. Uh, there is a great deal to say about portability, and one is that right now it's very difficult because we have not come to terms on standards. We haven't agreed on what are the right kinds of building blocks to support. And as a result, you end up with different architectures uh, that are being built in hardware, uh, lending support to different ones of these operations, but not supporting them all in a uniform fashion. We're still trying to discover which ones are important. And so this is why you end up with non-portability of efficiencies and running times. This is completely aside from the question of will the code run at all, which I think is merely a matter of, of agreeing to implement compilers. It's, it's a difficult problem. and. Um, I think that's part of the point of this talk, is to bring forward one particular set of building blocks that I think can be treated as universal, and to try to get hardware architects, as well as language designers, to pay attention to these particular building blocks as exemplars of important things that need to be supported well in both software and hardware. And there are probably others that I haven't touched on, such as sorting. 
I'm James Momo from Howard University in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I have a number of questions that came out of the lecture and some of other personal professional interest with respect to this important topic. Uh, for dealing with uh, large matrices that are highly dense and sparse, um, there are methods that we normally will use to reduce the so-called computational body. And thus far, as you gave the very good presentation, it looks to me that there will be opportunities for uh, evolving or solving problems, uh, models that might involve sparsity. If this is true, how do and do you justify the overhead cost in terms of the cost of parallel processing as well as the cost of operations? You know, I know that uh, there are advantages in terms of the operational cost. But the overhead cost in terms of implementing such machines, especially where budgetary constraints might be uh, significant. Is the gist of your question that the kinds of matrix algorithms that I showed in this lecture are not suitable for sparse matrices because so much, so much of the processing power will be wasted? Yes. Yes, that is a very good criticism. And it would not be appropriate to use that kind of algorithm on a sparse matrix, just as you wouldn't use the usual sequential triply nested loop you'd use for dense matrix on a sparse one. Sparse matrix processing on a data parallel computer calls for very different approaches that I did not illustrate in this talk. And they are more difficult and typically call for the kinds of irregular permutations and communications techniques uh, that, that, we, that I illustrated before. Because the particular patterns of communication in the processing of sparse matrices depend so much on the particular content of the matrix. I'd just like you to make a comment on the combination of uh, hierarchical structures in problem solving rather than just the, uh, plain parallel processing or sequential, using hier and hierarchical structures to enhance some of the approaches that you've discussed. What would that gain or give you? Uh, could you be more specific? Uh, to, to have a, a hierarchical structures where you have a main taskmaster that sort of contr uh, control the sequence of operation that is done at a lower level of the sequence of um, activities that is being done in parallel. In other words, we are the local members or local elements have a chance to communicate among themselves as well as direct um, information to the higher level taskmaster. Oh, I think I see. I've shown simply a two-level hierarchy. At most, I've shown a single global source for, for, for example, broadcasting. And then a sort of homogeneous array of processes. One might imagine a more complex hierarchical structuring of the processing elements. Yes. Is that your suggestion? Yes. Uh, I think that is a largely unexplored area. That's another thing that I would regard as uh, an open research topic as to the best way to organize that. And the difficulty is providing the flexibility at the, at the programming level to be able to organize the hierarchy in the way demanded by the problem. We have seen a number of hardware architectures that organize hardware processing elements hierarchically, but with more or less ability to reorganize those processors because I don't think it's well enough understood how to make a sufficiently flexible communication system that allows you to restructure that hierarchy, unless, of course, you provide a completely general communication system, in which case the hierarchy again disappears at the hardware level, and it's up to the language implementer to, to provide that hierarchical organization at the language level. And we have not yet seen that emerging either, and I think that's a very good point. So those for the uh, algorithms for solving uh, mixed integer, say maybe, uh, linear uh, programming, but when you have, you know, nonlinear mixed integer programming, one of the topics you covered include enumeration, mm -hmm. so which suggests that um, if we really want to solve the class of branch and bound problems that you require uh, either deep search or breadth wide type search, mm -hmm. uh, this parallel processing might be a very important tool to solve some of, to solve the problem of. Um, um, you know, mixed in nonlinear type programming with branch and bounding. Yeah, it may well be. It is sometimes possible to use data parallel techniques to do what look like unstructured searches in, for example, a tree, for example, a game tree, uh, using branch and bound techniques or other techniques uh, related to it by maintaining a work queue very much as you might in a, in a more control parallel oriented style. And at every step, taking a large number of, of task items off that work queue simultaneously by using an enumeration step and using, using the result of that enumeration to assign them to processors. Sometimes this is effective, providing the rest of the work to be done in each of these tasks is sufficiently similar. If it's not, then control parallelism may be more suited to a task like that.
Gerald Strong, Hogeschool Utrecht, the Netherlands. With the current expertise, software expertise in four GL, four generation languages for sequential machines, I would like to know your view if developing of data parallel programming languages will at end at least at four GL level or up. I have seen the development of software based on the data parallel paradigm. Uh, I was about to say parallel. Let me say reenact the history of the development of sequential uh, programming languages and, and software systems. And I think we are now at the point where we understand how to make data parallel languages at about the level of expressiveness of C, Fortran, possibly Lisp. And I think it's going to take a while before we can rework our understanding of this to raise the level of expressiveness to that of fourth generation languages. I think it's just a matter of time and learning. We still don't understand how to fit these building blocks together to make abstractions at that level. And uh, I think that's great, because it would be no fun if there weren't interesting new problems to work on.